Hi guys, a good day to everyone. So today for Pharma, we are going to discuss about drugs that are acting on the autonomic nervous system. So what are these drugs all about? We're going to find them out here. So before we continue with our topic, I would like to inform everyone that from now on, I'm going to only discuss the important points of our subject for term three. Since there are a lot, I will only talk about the important points that you need to know. You can read the rest of your modules together with your book if you want additional information about uh, our topics. You can ask me anything all about them if you have any questions about them. But for now, I'm going to discuss or the important points that we have. So let's start out first with the adrenergic agonists. So these are drugs that stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And they're also known as sympathomimetic drugs because they mimic the sympathetic nervous uh, neurotransmitters. What do we mean by this? They imitate the, the effects of sympathetic nervous system stimulation. If you recall your anatomy subject, uh, there's this topic about the autonomic nervous system. It has two divisions. We have one, the sympathetic nervous system, and two, the parasympathetic nervous system. The effects of the sympathetic nervous system stimulation is that when it is stimulated, all of the bodily systems increase in functioning except for two. What are these two? We have the gastrointestinal and the genitourinary systems. But for the opposite, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, for para, there will be a decrease in function of all bodily systems except for two again. The, the two will increase in function instead, which is the GI and the genitourinary. So what do the adrenic, adrenergic agonists do? They act on the effector cells of muscles from the following organs, such as the heart, the bronchial walls, the GI tract, urinary bladder, and the ciliary muscles of our eyes, which controls the pupil size. So for the sympathetic nervous system, once it stimulates, there will be pupil dilation. But if the parasympathetic system stimulated, there will be pupil constriction instead. Sympathetic nervous system stimulation, it inhibits salivation. The opposite occurs in parasympathetic. It, you, there's increase in salivation. Relaxes bronchi here in sympa, uh, sympathetic nervous system, the opposite occurs. Accelerates heartbeat here in sympa, um, decreased heartbeat in para. Inhibition of peristalsis and secretion here in sympathetic, but for parasympathetic, it increases peristalsis and gastric secretions. Stimulates glucose production and release, but inhibits on para, parasympathetic. Secretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline here, but there's inhibition of these hormones, which is also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine in para. And it inhibits bladder contraction in the sympathetic nervous system, but it stimulates it in the parasympathetic. And it stimulates the orgasm here in the sympathetic nervous system, which is the climax for sexual intercourse. So you should know the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So if there are increased vital signs, that is sympathetic nervous system. But if there are decreased vital signs, the parasympathetic nervous system is the one acting there. Now we go to these receptor sites and their physiologic responses. For alpha-1, receptor sites, this increases the force of heart contractions, vasoconstriction, increased BP, there's midriasis or dilation of pupil. Take note of how I pronounce it, midriasis, my mouth dilates, ah, sis. The opposite of midriasis is meiosis, my mouth constrict with its pronunciation, meiosis. So that's pupil constriction if it's for meiosis, midriasis, meiosis. 
And there's decreased secretion of salivary glands in alpha-1, increases urinary bladder relaxation and urinary sphincter contractions. For alpha-2, it inhibits release of norepinephrine, dilates blood vessels, produces hypotension or low blood pressure, decreases GI motility and tone. For beta-1, it increases heart rate and forcing of contraction. It increases renin secretion. If you know more all about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, we'll discuss that further in the drugs for hypertension, which will in turn increase BP or blood pressure. Beta-2 receptor sites dilates the bronchioles, promotes GI and uterine relaxation, promotes increase in blood sugar through gluconeogenolysis in the liver, and it increases blood flow in the skeletal muscles. Glucogenolysis is where a breakdown of glucose stores in the liver occurs if the beta-2 receptor sites are stimulated. Side effects. Notable side effects of these drugs, the adrenergic agonists, is that person may feel tachycardia, palpitations, tremors, dizziness, and increased blood pressure. But most likely, patients who take in adrenergic agonists will feel both tachycardia and palpitations. And what are examples of the alpha and beta adrenergic agonists? We have epinephrine or adrenaline chloride, norepinephrine by tartrate, levofed, dopamine hydrochloride, inotropin, dobutamine hydrochloride, dobutrex, ephedrine hydrochloride or ephedrine sulfate, PRETS D, terbutaline sulfate. These drugs will help increase the heart rate, myocardial contractility, bronchodilation, and respirations, increase in death and rate. And where are they given these drugs? They are given for patients who are experiencing shock, most likely hypovolemic shock. It's for the treatment of shock. If there's too much blood that has been lost and there's a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in heart rate, and so on, these drugs might be given. Or there's cardiac arrest. Epinephrine is the number one drug that is going to be given. Or if the patient is experiencing anaphylactic shock, because they have taken in an allergic uh, substance or food, epinephrine will be given uh, for anaphylactic shock or for those who are experiencing severe hypotension or those who are also experiencing asthma, severe asthma. Now we go to the adrenergic blocking agents. They are known as sympatholytic drugs because they lie or block or inhibit the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So they are the opposites of the adrenergic agonists now. So they block these things from happening. Alpha-1 receptors, they cause vasodilation, decrease BP, reflex tachycardia might result, meiosis. So this was the one I was talking about earlier. Suppresses ejaculation. Reduces contraction of smooth muscles in bladder, neck, and prostate gland. Glad, uh, beta 1 decreases the heart rate and reduces the force of contraction. Beta 2 constricts the bronchioles, contracts uterus, and inhibits glucogenolysis. So it inhibits the uh, conversion of glucose stores in the liver, which will, of course, in turn decrease the blood sugar. We have the alpha and beta adrenergic blocking agents. We have amiodarone, bretillium, carvedilol, guana guanadrel, and guanethidine. These are drugs that can be used to treat hypertension and also are used as an antiarrhythmic agent for those who are suffering from arrhythmias or tachycardia or those who are suffering from severe hypertension. These drugs can be given to them. And some of these drugs, like amiodarone, they are given to patients who are experiencing pupil or pupil constriction brought about by glaucoma. 
Now we go to the beta adrenergic blocking agents, those ending in olol. As you can see here, we have propranolol, carthiolol, nadolol, penbutolol, pindolol, and sotalol. Except for timolol, timolol is also under this, but it's not used for the treatment of hypertension. It's used for the treatment of glaucoma to reduce the intraocular pressure. You will learn more about glaucoma in your third years. Because of the increased pressure that is building up inside the eye, the tendency is for the patient to experience tunnel vision. Tunnel, tunnel vision meaning they can only, uh, they have lost their peripheral vision. So they can only see straight. They cannot see their sights. So primarily, these drugs are used to treat hypertension, angina, and it prevents myocardial infarction. But primarily, they are given for patients who have hypertension because these drugs will help decrease the blood pressure. Side effects, it's the opposite. If the adrenergics can cause tachycardia, this time it will cause bradycardia, hypotension, headaches, dizziness, cold extremities, hypoglycemia, and bronchospasms. That's why F, one of our nursing responsibilities when giving these types of drugs is to check first for their heart rate and their blood pressure. It's very, very important to check the heart rate and blood pressure before giving these kinds of drugs. Now we go to the direct acting cholinergic agents. We have bethanicol. This is used to treat post-op and postpartum urinary retention and bladder atony by increasing the muscle tone. So for those who have uh, undergone surgeries, major surgeries, or a delivery, this will help treat urinary retention. Brought about by, and bladder atony brought about by um, the anesthesia. Sivimelin, this will increase secretions and relieve the symptoms of dry mouth for patients who are experiencing dry mouth. Carbacol and pilocarpine, they are used to induce meiosis for patients who have glaucoma. Here, it's here, or pupil constriction. Because again, there's increased intraocular pressure in the eye. So there's too much fluid buildup inside the eye. So to reduce or to induce meiosis, we give these drugs, carbacol and pilocarpine. We're through with these. Now we go to the anticholinergic agents. These are drugs that inhibit the as actions of acetylcholine by occupying the acetylcholine receptors. They're also known as parasympatholytics, cholinergic blocking agents, antiparasympathetic agents, anti-muscarinic agents, and antispasmodics. Take note, muscarinic agent, anti-muscarinic. So, if you recall the effect or the anticholinergic side effects of the antipsychotics and antidepressants, the, the, what do you call this, the steps to Macarena, this is it. The, this is what the anticholinergic agents do. Their, their action is to do those things. The, the ones I've mentioned in the steps of Macarena, such as um, decreasing the, or decreasing the production of saliva, since there's dry mouth, causing constipation. So what are the, their effects again? Cardiovascular increases heart rate with large doses and small doses can decrease heart rate. GI relaxes smooth muscle tone of the GI tract. That's why there is constipation. So there's decreased GI motility and peristalsis. It decreases the gastric secretions as well. Urinary tract, that's why there's urinary retention, which is one of the steps in Macarena that I've taught you. It relaxes the bladder detrusor muscle and increases constriction of the urinary or the internal muscle sphincter. So urinary retention can result. For ocular, dilates pupils, midriasis, and paralyzes the ciliary muscle, which causes a decrease in accommodation. Glandular, decreases salivation, perspiration, and bronchial secretions. That's why there's dry mouth. 
bronchial, it dilates the bronchi and decreases bronchial secretions. And the CNS decreases tremors and rigidity of muscles, drowsiness, disorientation, and hallucination can result from large doses. In cardiovascular, you can also add hypo hypostatic or orthostatic hypotension, wherein if the patient will uh, suddenly rise from a sitting to standing position or from uh, lying to a sitting position, they will they might experience dizziness. What are examples of anticholinergic agents? We have atropine sulfate. Atropine sulfate is usually given for patients who will undergo major surgeries. This is one of the drugs that are given preoperatively. When we say preoperatively, pre means before or before the patient will undergo a surgery. Why? Because during surgery, if you do not decrease the secretions of a patient, this will make them prone to aspirations. They will aspirate with their own secretions or their own saliva, their own mucus secretions from the respiratory tract. So in order to avoid that from happening, even the GI, it can regurgitate with GI secretions, the gastric acid. So to, to decrease them, we give atropine sulfate to prevent aspiration from occurring. Dicyclomine, antispas, this is given for patients who have irritable bowel syndrome. They experience diarrhea. Chronic diarrhea because of having this disease, irritable bowel syndrome. It relaxes the GI tract in order for them to relieve the signs and symptoms of having irritable bowel syndrome. Let's say, for example, they accidentally ate a, uh, a food that contained pepper or any spices that can irritate their GI tract, they will immediately defecate or have bowel movement. So in order to prevent that from happening, we give the, this drug to those, those patients. For, fa for patients who are also um, experiencing nausea and vomiting, scopolamine or transderm scop can be given to help relieve the feeling of nausea and vomiting. So scopolamine is the drug for those who feel nauseous. So uh, these drugs, they depress salivation and bronchial secretions, dilate the bronchi, relax the GI and urinary tracts, and inhibit GI secretion. They also cause midriasis. So if you have any questions about my lecture today regarding the adrenergic agents, adrenergic antagonists, cholinergic and anticholinergic agents, please do not hesitate to ask me all about them. Again, thank you everyone for attending today's lecture. Have a great day. Our next topic would be on uh, drugs for the endocrine system. Thank you.